There's a certain black humor in the literary, or I don't know what you'd call it, TV or movie figure of the frustrated torturer. The guy who's, I don't know, um, done everything he can, and he's reporting back to his master, saying, I don't know what to do. This, this guy won't break. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Maybe the torturer is uh, facing torture himself if he fails. But sometimes it doesn't work on people, and the torturer is stumped. Uh, he's tried various things, to uh, horrific tortures, to get the, his subject to give him the information that he wants, and it doesn't always work. Ask a torturer. Study the phenomenon. Um, it's not quite as easy as one thinks. Uh, this rather horrific dialogue took place right after 9-11. Uh, there was a public discourse on whether or not one should torture um, Al-Qaeda prisoners uh, if one takes them in order to get information to stop another 9-11. And one, uh, or some of the more intelligent people simply said, oh, the, the whole thing is kind of moot anyway, because you don't really get what you want out of somebody by torturing them in, in a lot of cases, and torturing isn't really all that reliable. Because it's in many ways an elaborate mind game between two people. And the person on the receiving end of the torture is nowhere near as helpless as one thinks. Um, because that person has something that the other person wants. And probably 99 times out of 100, the person on the receiving end of the torture assumes they're going to get killed anyway. Because, well, look what they're doing to me. They won't think twice about doing me in. So what have I got to lose? Why should I betray my friends or whatever if they're going to kill me anyway? I might as well see this thing through because I'm just going to die. Um, but again, who knows what's going through the mind of someone who's on the rack? <laughs> uh, we don't. Uh, there was a flaw that Fede pointed out in my previous example about Room 101, in which he said that it's entirely possible that each person would break at exactly the same time second, simply because they're facing the unendurable, and that which is by definition unendurable cannot be endured, therefore death will have no fear for them, and they will seek to be annihilated to avoid any more torture. He's right, of course. But if, you know, we can correct that rather quickly. You just sit there for five minutes while the torture explains to you what's going to happen. Now, that can play on your mind, and you might last, you know, a few seconds longer as a result of that. This is incidentally exactly what happened in the novel in 1984. Uh, O'Brien took a sadistic pleasure in going through every little detail of exactly what was going to happen to Winston Smith when the rats shot into his face and started tearing at it. Um, this is what's going to happen, Winston. And this is, of course, what worked. He broke before the torture actually began. So, torture doesn't always work, hence the frustrated torturer. Torture often does work, however. People capitulate immediately, make the torture stop, um, kill me if you have to. Not in all cases. Why does somebody stand up to torture better than someone else? even when they're both faced with the worst thing in the world. And there are cases of this, of course. If you want to go into the literature of torture, um, I once did a minor study of, uh, it was called the Junta of the Colonels, I think, in Greece in the 1960s when they tortured people, and they, the torturers said the same thing. It's, it, it, you don't, you'd be surprised how little use you can actually get out of it, and they're being quite clinical about it. You can't r always get what you want out of people, because there's something that they refuse to give up, uh, up to and including um, at the pain of death. You've held their head underwater for a long period of time, repeatedly, and they still won't tell you. Um, you feel a sense that they're defying you, that they're winning this mind game, that you've put their feet to the fire, literally or figuratively, and they still refuse. Other people capitulate immediately, 
even at the threat of torture. They simply cannot entertain the thought of being tortured like this. It's more of a psychological thing than anything else. It's just pure distilled essence of horror, the idea of being in a torture chamber with all these instruments and all these things they're going to do to you. You break immediately because that's just the way you are. Others don't. And you ask or you look at um, the records or the, I don't know, the uh, experiences of torturers and they'll tell you the same thing. They say, well, this person is just too stubborn and everything I've tried to scare them with doesn't scare them. Or at least it doesn't scare them enough for them to give me what I want and I don't know what to do now. Hence the frustrated torturer which, uh, again, you see in, you know, a lot of movies, or you read about actually in real life. Um, oh, just kill him. Never mind then. Okay, well, he's uh, not going to give in to your torture, so you do him in, or whatever, or you find something else. I don't know. But it doesn't always work. That's essentially the point. And some people are more impervious to it than others. Now, the why of it is what fascinates me. We've all got our theories, don't we? But there are as many theories as there are people, I guess. Some people say it's out of fear of death that you wouldn't break because you know the second that you say your safe word, uh, your torturer euthanizes you and you don't want to die. So you'll put up with five, ten, 15, 20 seconds more of unmitigated horror for no other reason than the fact that you don't want to die and you're terrified of dying. Your fear of death is greater than your horror at being tortured. So you, one fear trumps the other and you continue to resist. Fear is what motivates you. One fear is greater than another. Now, that's one explanation. How about you love life so much that your love of a simple existence, simple being, the sim simply your love of the ability to have experiences is greater than your fear or your hatred or your, or your aversion to more agony and perhaps even despair and horror. You feel these things. You feel the despair, the agony, and the horror. But your love of existence, your love of being is greater than your fear of all of these things. We can't rule that out. In one case, the person is driven by fear. They don't want to die and they'll do anything to stave off that moment of annihilation. They're horrified and they prioritize their horrors and the horror of death is greater than the horror of continued existence in a state of horrific torture. In the other case, the person loves life so much that they're able to endure more torture because a life or a state of being even when being subjected to excruciating torture, is still preferable, is still desirable, is still something that one wants to continue, rather than face annihilation. It's not that one fears annihilation, it's just, well, okay, I like existing, therefore I'll put up with the torture. Um, I can stop this at any moment, and that's kind of a source of strength, isn't it? Okay, when this really begets in, becomes intolerable, I'll kill myself, but it's not intolerable yet. And even though I'm being tortured, I like being alive. I like the state of being. Fear of death. Fear of annihilation. Fear of non-existence or non-being is not the same thing as love of life, 
love of being, love of existence, attraction versus repulsion. In one case, the person is running from a monster, and that monster is annihilation, even though they are being chased by two monsters at once. One monster is torture, the other is annihilation. Which one is going to win? Well, which one do you fear most? The fear of annihilation. All right, I'll put up with more torture because that's the lesser of two horrors. Another person sees a horror, i.e. torture, but they believe that they are in possession of a prize, of a positive, that's called existence or being. They will tolerate the torture because they believe on a cost-benefit analysis the torture they are enduring is not sufficient for them to abandon that which they love, which is being. I'm not saying that this is true in all cases of people being subjected to tortures. That's just a thought experiment that I grabbed out of my favorite author, George Orwell. We can't rule that out, though. Um, being, simple existence, does it have value? I believe it does. Phone's ringing. <laughs>